to make sure you see that as well. Hello and welcome into this week's edition of AFMC TV. I'm your host, Michelle Rupp. Joining me today is Dr. Chad Rogers, uh, pediatrician as well as the medical director here at AFMC. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I haven't seen you yet. I so know. I hope you had a good holiday. <laughs> it was a great holiday season. I hope you did as well. Yeah, it was great. It's fun to see friends and family Lots and family. just and all. lots to eat and lots to do. <laughs> yes. And lots to uh, work off now right. as we launch into 2022. Resolution uh, time. I mean, yes. And and really one of those is uh, weight loss. Right. And for some people, um, that is in the form of using an appetite suppressant. Right. Um, whether that is their um, uh, main, main um formula for weight loss or whether they use that um, kind of in addition to as a supplement in addition to the exercise and watching what they eat and all that right. jazz but um let's talk about appetite suppressants and i guess basically i mean just at the very elementary level yeah what is an appetite suppressant so an appetite suppressant is something that suppresses your appetite it obviously it it but you know a lot of people think that appetite originates in your stomach and your gut because that's where you feel hunger right mm -hmm. but really a lot of appetite is stimulated from the brain that's so you're insane. Yeah, it all starts here. And so your body sends hormones to your stomach that says, I'm hungry, I need to eat, I need calories. But then there's also feedback from the stomach that goes back to your brain, telling your brain when it's full or when it wants more or when it's not satisfied. Mm -hmm. So appetite stimulants sort of work in those two areas. One, to maybe increase um, your energy level. So you um, are burning more calories, but also to suppress that, uh, that, that, that hunger, that that's kind of, I mean, it's almost kind of like those cravings that people mm -hmm. have, uh, but they also sometimes work in the kind of the brain to kind of help control those kind of impulses to um, eat and binge because this is a very popular time of year. The days are short, it's dark, you go home, people are lonely, yeah. you want carbs, you want to eat, right? So yeah. this kind of helps with, with curbing those, those cravings. So are these a good idea? By and large. So by and large, um, I think you have to be careful because there's a lot out there. So if you go on right now and you Google appetite uh, stimulants or suppressants, um, sorry, you don't want to stimulate, you want to suppress it. Um, you will see lots that is that is on the market. There's a lot of things that are over the counter, and there are things that are prescription as well. And so, you know, consulting with your physician to kind of see number one, what's the best choice for you? Of course, you're going to get the good old diet and exercise um, sure. um, kind of speech from your primary care physician or your or whoever you're seeing for weight loss. Um, but a lot of these things are not, you know, approved by the FDA for um, controlling appetite, and so. So, um, you, and so there's a lot of variation sometimes in what's in those pills and what you could be taking. And if you have something like high blood pressure, or you have something like anxiety, or you have something you know else that's going on, sometimes it can make it worse. So okay. best place to start, think about talking to your primary care doctor. You know, appetite suppressants for the long term are not like the solution. They're, they're, but they're made for some people be a really good start. You know, that, that especially that beginning of the year when you want to get that jump start, mm -hmm. you want to get kind of started on your weight loss program and you're feeling kind of lethargic and you'd like to have a little bit more energy and you'd like to begin to control the appetite because all we've done for the last several weeks is eat all those things Free that make all. us, I mean, the, those things that make us feel so good, you know? Because it's been hard. Yeah. We've had a hard two years. Yeah, <laughs> so. we had the whole pandemic. I mean. <laughs> and when people are stressed, you know, your body secretes hormones that, that increase your appetite. So yeah. stress is a real big uh, uh, issue as far as driving hunger. What about those individuals who, let's be honest, they're not going to talk to the primary care. Right. They're headed to Walgreens, CVS, right. Target, and they are looking over the counter and sure, I saw this commercial. Right. And, you know, she looked great in her bikini. You know, <laughs> right. that'll work for me. I mean, anything that we need to uh, just be mindful of uh, an ingredient, like you you wouldn't want ephedrine, right? Right. Uh, that might not even be legal anymore, I'm not sure. But right, right. Um, things that we could just keep in mind for those people who just are done and they are headed 
um, to target to pick something up. So what you'll see in a lot of those things are stimulants. Like I think the most common thing or the most thing, common thing we can compare that to is caffeine. So caffeine sort of is a natural stimulant. It's yeah. also a natural um, appetite suppressant. So you'll see something similar to caffeine or something um, along those lines that are in the stimulant family uh, in those products. So, I, I mean, I think what you have to know is that these are for sort of a short-term solution. The best weight loss occurs over the year. Um, you're not gonna look beach body by, you know, a 12 week course of, of appetite stimulants, unless you are already pretty close to your goal weight. But for people who are pretty overweight, you know, if you weigh 200 pounds, 5% is a significant weight loss. So, yeah. um, so kind of looking um, at what those ingredients are, uh, read, the, read the cautions that a lot of times you'll see, because because if you do have diabetes or something else going on, um, you would wanna be careful about your selection of those things. Okay, and as you've said, these are not long-term solutions. Right. Uh, about how how long uh, should someone be taking appetite suppressants if, if they're going to jump on that wagon? Right. So twelve weeks is sort of the general rule of thumb. Okay. So uh, you know you don't want to do more than that. Uh, of course, you know in the process of, of doing all that, thinking about what you're going to do is your next steps. You know you're going to get your exercise routine. You're going to be eating uh, better. Um, if you do start to see, um, I mean, the most common thing is people have heart racing, maybe increased sweating, get shaky, yeah. stop, you yeah. know, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't improve with that, uh, then, you know, definitely seek care. Um, a, a lot of things, a lot of times people will feel that kind of rush from it. And so, um, I mean, people have described like tingling of the scalp and the lips and stuff like that from, mm -hmm. from these segments. And those, those may be a little bit too much for you. And especially mm -hmm. if you're a smaller person, uh, because these aren't, um, you know, you're getting one size fits all, um, no pun intended. Uh, but it's, you know, if you're a smaller person, you may have more um, adverse effects. I like what you said too, about be thinking what your next step is, mm -hmm. where at the end of those 12 weeks, you know what, because if you go back to eating the way you were 12 weeks before, right. it's all coming back. Right. And so that 12 weeks that you were on the appetite suppressant really just made you fabulous for 12 weeks, but then, you know, you're, you're right back down. So that's a really good point using that time to and start to instill right. healthy routine, healthier habits getting the junk food out of the house and then right. don't bring it back in. Right. And that's the danger to the appetite suppressants so, so you do the 12 weeks and then you go right back to your old habits. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you see a lot of rebound um, with weight gain and sometimes people will gain even more of their pounds back uh, mm -hmm. because they'll just kind of they have deprived themselves for so long. They go right back to eating and maybe even eating even more than they were before. So then what happens at the end of those 12 weeks when you stop taping, taking them? Is there any type of could you experience any type of withdrawals or anything like that? Or are we not really going down that road uh, because of the type of suppressant that it is? Right. So again, thinking about things like caffeine, because a lot of us have had a lot of experience with caffeine and we've tried to quit using uh, caffeine or coffee, and, you know, or maybe reduce our, our, our use of it. So things that you see commonly are some symptoms of like headache and just fatigue and not feeling well. So um, some people, sometimes people will have some um, kind of withdrawal symptoms as they're decreasing their dose or going off the medication. So just cut again, probably a good reason to kind of do that consultation with a professional, yeah. a nutritionist, um, you know, someone who works in the weight loss area or if you're talking with your, your, your family doc or your family physician. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Well, let's also talk, um, because you alluded to it earlier, we are in the time of year where it's gray, right. it's dreary. Um, it's, a, it's a good day when we see the sunshine, right. but um, those days are kind of few and far between right now. Um, Seasonal affective disorder. Right. Uh, I would think this is the time of year, boy, it is full throttle for individuals who suffer from that. Let's first talk about a little bit about what that is. Yeah, so we're headed into what people call the winter blues, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, and January is actually known as the saddest month of the year. I mean, we've had this whole oh. season. I know it's, you know, we've had uh, November and, and, and December with the holidays and seeing family and friends and going to things. And then January, the days are the shortest, you know, uh, it gets dark early, the sun doesn't come up to later, it's cold, so you wanna stay inside a lot more cloudy gloomy rainy days in january and even into february so people don't know exactly what causes seasonal affective disorder there's definitely a lot of um 
uh, thoughts about the most common one is sunlight um, that we kind of just kind of lose our natural biorhythms, our natural rhythms. Um, we're not getting as much light as we do. And of course, you know, that stimulates a lot of other hormones in our body that kind of make us feel good and stuff like that. So people commonly think about seasonal affective disorder in the winter. There are people who also have seasonal affective disorder in the spring or in the summer which people don't talk about quite as often, yeah. but it's something that's seasonal. So you may already have some depression or some sort of mood uh, disturbance. Maybe you're having trouble sleeping or you're just feeling sad or lonely, um, but it only lasts for a couple of weeks to months. And then during the rest of the year, you feel fine. So that's what you kind of commonly see with seasonal affective disorder. Um, and it's fairly common. Um, kind of see um, it cl running close family members. Many times people, if they have uh, another family member who suffers from seasonal affective disorder, if you already have a mood disorder, and when I talk about mood disorders, things like depression and anxiety, uh, those things all seem to get worse. Can anyone develop this or is it the genetic? Yeah, anybody can develop this at any, any time. At any time, okay. and you know, it tends to be very seasonal, very patternish. Uh, sometimes people will just kind of have maybe a bad year, maybe it will be worse some years than other years, and so. But really, all of us are vulnerable uh, to getting it, and it's um, you know, it's not anything that you're doing wrong necessarily. It's just it's getting dark, and you really in the in the furthest parts of the north and the furthest parts of the south in the world, you see a lot of seasonal affective disorder sure. because the, the days are really, really short and the nights are really, really long. Mm -hmm. So what can we do if we are suffering or if we suspect we might be? Right. So there's a couple easy things to do. Number one, make sure you're getting plenty of sleep. Make sure you're eating well, drinking plenty of water. Um, and you know, we do occasionally have those great, beautiful, sunny days, even in January and February. Mm -hmm. So really trying to make time to schedule time to get out and get into the natural sun, because that really seems to be what helped. Well, we're your sunscreen, but um, you know, getting out and doing some exercise helps a lot um, and um, getting that sunlight. You will see things called light boxes online and a lot of people will order those. So um, if, when you first wake up in the morning, you do about 20, 30 minutes of this white light. So it sort of it kind of acts like natural light. Uh, although the good thing about these boxes is they do filter out a lot of the, lot of the dangerous UV light. Okay. Um, so um, kind of to protect the eyes and to protect the skin. Um, sometimes what I've often seen with people with seasonal affective disorder is they'll go to the tanning bed in order to mm -hmm. to treat their season and it does help warm you up and it does give you some vitamin d <laughs> and it does but it, it's not good for your skin that's not necessarily the right the right <laughs> so choice either not the so. right choice either so these light boxes are a much uh, safer alternative uh, for improving your mood and kind of getting the light that you need to kind of stimulate that. And I think the third thing is that sometimes, you know, we need to think about going on medication. So there are medications that treat um, anxiety and depression that help increase those hormones in the brain that seem to decrease during the winter. Uh, and so you want to talk to your mental health professional or your family doctor or whoever you sort of see uh, to kind of talk about maybe you might want to go on something for a couple of months just to get you through those winter blues. Okay. Something else that is prime for wintertime, I would think, and this this has to do with our, with our kids, yeah. not so much adults, but with kids, and this is not a pleasant topic to, uh, to no, bring yeah. up, um, head lice. Oh yeah, so everybody's <laughs> going to be doing this by head the end lice. of the segment. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, it w is it fair to say that this is the time of year when kids are more susceptible to contracting head lice? Right, it's a time of the year where kids are indoors a lot more and together a lot more and in close contact a lot more. It's also, uh, even though it's not spread as easily with sharing of caps and, and things that we use over our head, um, it is a time of year that we tend to use those a little bit more. So anything that kind of brings kids very close contact, especially their heads in close contact together, um, uh, whether it's playing or sleepovers or whatever they're doing, um, that's a time of year where we start to see um, head lice. We do see it all season, but um, this is, we're all indoors a little bit more, a little bit more togetherness always leads to a little bit more of all the, the, the good stuff. Mm, yes. <laughs> so what I'm sure you've been on the other end of that phone <clears throat> when, a, when a mom has called and right. said, ah! <laughs> <laughs> well, what do I do? And, and, and what do you do? I know there are some over-the-counter 
things. And I guess right. it just kind of depends on the stage the lice is right. in. Right, right. There's a lot of a lot of things, and there's a lot of things that can mimic or look like lice. And it is sometimes mothers and fathers' greatest fears. Uh, school nurses, you know, it yeah. just becomes a full time job for them when there is a lice outbreak. Uh, so they also <laughs> sort of dread it, but often are a good source uh, to talk to about the treatment of head lice. Um, so number one. Anybody can get head lice. Short hair, long hair, rich, poor, uh, bad living conditions, good living conditions. So there's there's nothing, we're, we're all susceptible. Children, preschool children, elementary school children are at particular risk because of the things that they do. I mean, you and I don't hang out and put our heads together and, and <laughs> for a long period of time, which is what you really need is that close contact. So once um, a case identified, it's important to treat. Um, there are a lot of treatments available over the counter. There are some that are very um, safe um, that are actually, uh, so medicines that kind of kill the louse or the lice, which is the bug that causes the eggs to be laid or lays the eggs. And then um, those hatch and then produce more. And then you get these kind of white knits or you get the eggs that are attached real closely to the hair shaft. So um, there's a lot of also kind of um, a natural methods. A lot of people will use things like olive oil and mayonnaise. Uh, yeah, and just kind of try to smother the louse, but you still ha really have to go finally through the hair and remove those nits and those eggs with a, with a lice comb. So, which is a very grueling process. Um, the one thing to remember is that the louse or the, the lice that are on your scalp they're not deadly. They're not the worst thing in the world. Right. This is treatable. This is something to take care of. Um, but they are very bothersome. It can be very worrisome. And that also often leads to kids being put out of school for long periods of time until they can kind of come back and be kind of louse free or nut uh, the egg or the knit free. And so um, it's relatively hard to spread, even though it's more spread more easily among that age group, um, but sometimes schools will not allow a kid to come back to school, and that could that could be you know in a short season, and when we've already been out and we've got COVID, that's right, that's um, right. and putting kids out of school, uh, you know, um, just uh, you know consulting with your doctor, seeing what the best treatment is, make sure that it's not something else like dandruff uh, or something like that. And just because a child comes home with it, it does not necessarily mean the household is doomed. Right. Um, let, that that every person in the household is going to get it. Right, right. And it, But it is good to go ahead, to, you know, to treat the child or the person who has um, the case of, uh, of the lice. Uh, but also, you know, it's okay to go ahead and, you know, let the family members kind of use that treatment um, and just to make sure that, you know, that, that it doesn't continue to spread within the household. Um, you know, one thing to know that some of these medications, some of the things we use are toxic. I mean, they're toxic to the louse and they're toxic to the egg sometimes. So they are to use be used with caution. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why we kind of encourage people to go ahead and reach out to their, their, their physician to talk about what's the best choice and where should we start and what should we do. Um, the other thing is there are also one of the big things of getting, if you don't want to do the knits yourself, there are services that are available if are. You, where a nurse or someone who has a lot of experience will come through and do the very grueling, time consuming, fine comb mm -hmm. layer removal of the knit. Uh, and um, but it takes quite a bit of time and some, it usually takes more than one treatment. Mm -hmm. So um, so those the, the, that's the commitment to Bless getting rid those of Bless those angels. I know, <laughs> that's I know. That's not my calling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Dr. Rogers, thank you so much yeah. for coming in. It's always good to have you on. Happy New Year. Yeah, thanks, Great things energy. ahead for us in 2022. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here next week for more AFMC TV.